Your Turn to Die is a game that is full of complex and nuanced characters. Amidst that, there is a certain character that is the subject of heavy debate, taking multiple forms. Are they really that nuanced? Are they actually poorly written in one route or another? Maybe we never really understood them. That character is none other than the sheep boy himself, Anmaru Kagayama. With this video, I will be attempting to answer these questions the way I see it, throwing my own hat into the ring on the endless discussion. I hope that by the end of this video, you are able to consider my analysis and make your own determination on who you believe Don Maru really is. To begin to reach an understanding of who Don Maru was intended to be, let's start with an excerpt from the official art book released with the Steam version of the game. Likes has nothing he can proudly say he likes. He often plays video games and watches videos, but considers them mere time wasters. Part of him wishes to find something he can be passionate about. Dislikes. Hates happy couples. Seeing people who are students like him, yet having fun, gives him murky feelings, putting him in a sullen mood. Upon his very introduction, Nanmaru seems relatively friendly, if a little nervous, with a seeming willingness to collaborate and do what needs to be done. We have no reason to suspect him of anything, yet we are already given inklings as to the darker underside of his character. One of the first things he does after being introduced to the story as a dummy companion to Sada is to show his insecurity. He's immediately on the defensive, and if you tell him to call you Mistress Sara, he says this. You're just wanting to make fun of me for my height, aren't you? Namaru is a character who is on the surface compliant and docile, keeping most of himself to himself. To borrow a phrase from Kyutaro in one of the most thematically resonant scenes in the game, he keeps his heart at a distance. Yet, we see glimpses of the emotions and intentions he held to himself when observing in retrospect. It all began when Sada noticed this sign, which at first she thought looked like a bathroom, but then she realized it was a hint to opening the door in front of them. A pair of partners had to hold hands, so she did it without giving it much thought. But what was to her simple progression was something very different different to Don Maru. Look how he reacts. He's stunned and takes a moment to collect his thoughts and move onward. Why does Don Maru hate seeing happy couples and people who are like him being happy? Why does that put him in a sullen mood? It doesn't take a detective to understand that it's projection and envy. Why do they get to have these things when he can't? What Nanmaru feels is not too uncommon for people his age and even older. He doesn't know how to define himself. He can't find the fun in anything and thinks filling his heart with someone else will make him whole. And yet, it's that very same longing that contributes to tearing him apart. There's no shame in going through this as a teenager, but an environment such as the death game exacerbates all of the best, and unfortunately the worst, of the human psyche. While Kana takes Midori's tag from Sada in her route, in the logic route it's Nanmaru who steps in instead. I always like this a little bit more, because when Kana does it, it's something she already would have done, and even kind of tried to in Chapter 2, in being willing to sacrifice herself for Sada. It was a resolution we saw in the emotional climax of that chapter. Meanwhile, when Nanmaru does it, it offers a little extra insight. We didn't know that Nanmaru had it in him to sacrifice himself for others, so this comes at a surprise. It's a turn that greatly improves how we feel towards him as an audience. At the same time, like many of his appearances, it geniusly hides the deeper flair. Unlike Kana, Nanmaru isn't doing this because of his bravery. It's actually quite the opposite. He remarks that he didn't do this because he's really willing to die, so they should hurry up. The real reason they took the tag is because at this point he feels like if Sara dies, he won't have anything to live for. A boy with no self-worth immediately stalking all he has into the first girl who showed him what he viewed as affection. If not for the red thread of fate tying them together with the threat of his head exploding if he gets too far away, Don Maru probably never would have had the confidence to try to to form a bond with the girl, if anyone at all, especially in these circumstances. But Sada immediately treated him like a friend and partner in the game, causing the lonely high school boy to quickly develop feelings. Before we move on, I would like to point out that up until this point, nothing about their relationship or interactions is determinative.
meant by the root. Meaning that Nanmari would have done the same in the emotion route, but he was too hesitant and someone else, that being Kana, took up this task instead. When we put these two outcomes together, we get the picture that it really was not something Nanmaru wanted to do, and if someone else was going to take it from her, he let them. This strengthens the argument that the only reason he ultimately does go through with this is because to him, losing Sara would be equal to him dying anyway. Your Turn to Die is a game that can be experienced by only playing through once and making the choices you will, but by playing all routes we get subtle insights such as this, which I think are very worth it for anyone attempting to understand it fundamentally. After watching the display Kutaro put on and showing his unwavering trust in even those who betrayed him, Namaru realized something. Or rather, it brought something Sada said to the forefront. It was that he and the others were being used as mere puppets by Midori, dancing to his tune. After the lava puzzle, Sada said, Human or doll, we are all victims. What Nanmaru now concluded was that they can't afford to fight amongst each other anymore when their real enemy is right in front of them. It is for that reason that he tears up the consent form before Sada can sign her life away. We're humans, we make our own choices. I'm not going to play along with Midori's puppet show anymore. This is what Nanmaru wants to believe. But does he really? Upon learning about upgrade parts thanks to the Sheen AI, Nanmaru checks by removing his own hand. On a first glance, this wouldn't seem to mean much, as everyone knows this Nanmaru is a doll, including himself. Yet upon seeing this, he is instantly deeply disturbed, panicking even. I really am a doll, huh? He says, the pretty words he spoke earlier crumbling with this simple reminder of the reality. It's not fair. I mean, sure, I did know that, but part of me just thought maybe. So all he said earlier, he said while well, still in denial. It's then that Yakusame chimes in with their own view of what makes a human separate from the literal reality. It's played as an uplifting moment with the music, but to what extent is Nanmaru really affected by this? It's certainly up to interpretation, as he simply gives a lot of ellipses and then denies he was crying. But we know earlier that he has his own view of what makes a human. It's someone who can create their own choices, right? And yet knowing that, he still broke down here. Would having another perspective really be enough to overcome this hangup? We've been shown that even with a philosophical mindset towards humanity, it didn't last as soon as he was confronted on the physical truth. Well, the sentiment is at least enough to distract him from his hopelessness and allow him to push forward a little longer. During their confrontation with Maple, Sada and Anmaru learn something about the endgame of the death game. Two individuals are allowed to win together, so long as one pledges to be a human and the other a doll. Setting aside the bride and groom marriage analogy, which happens to be relevant to Anmaru's state, it is this piece of information that has an extraordinary influence on him. Up until now, he had to accept that at the end of the day, they wouldn't both be able to survive. The meaning he had found in their relationship was fleeting, but now he learns that they can escape together. Suddenly, his future doesn't look hopeless, even if he really was at all. If there was some way to achieve this outcome, he would do anything to get there. Then there's this moment this has all been building up to. Upon the discovery of what the contract says, Sada thinks out loud about the possibility of ending the death game at the cost of her own life. It is then that Nanmaru utters the faithful suggestion. What do you think about winning? Sada says that no, she wants everyone to escape together. Nanmaru seems to concur that this would be the best outcome, but he isn't so hopeful. He asks if that's really possible. Then, for the first time, he expresses that hidden side of his character we've been talking about a little more honestly. When I'm with you, Sara, I feel more and more like I want to live. The more serious I get, the more afraid I am to die. If I want to get out of this alive, all I have to do is take you out, Sara. But I can't do something like that. On the other hand, I'm sure I could kill anyone else. Listen, Sara, win for me. Nanmaru accepted the tag because if Sada died, he didn't want to live. But he did want to live, and that's why he let Kana take the tag instead. 
In other words, he never truly cared about anyone else. He doesn't even care about Sada in a way where he actually understands her feelings. No, to this boy who can't help but project, she isn't a person with agency, but now a part of him. Danmaru is selfish and at the same time self-hating. He's actually an incredibly complex and conflicted character. They expect no less from Nankidai's writing, which is why I think it's weird how some fans view his actions from this point onward. This is where the major split happens. Sada responds differently depending on the route. In the emotion route, she tells him off with full moral conviction. She makes him see that what he is trying to do is wrong, and asserts herself as a human with her own morals that oppose his proposition, and forces him to expand his single-minded focus on her and see the greater picture of the people he is going to hurt. Sada, the only person who can possibly get through to him, cries, and he sees how hurtful his words were. I'm such a piece of shit. This is such a powerful line because not only does it show what I just said, but also that this outcome still is not perfect. In fact, he has even more reason, this time maybe valid reason, but more reason the same, to hate himself, and that is going to come into play later. Meanwhile, in the logic route, things take a turn for the sinister. Nanmaru, that won't go well. Eh? What am I? Uh, it'll be fine, Sara. I can never kill an ally. I know that. I'll, I'll do it myself. Idiot, what are you? That's not something you want, right? So it'll all be something I did on my own. Don't do it, Nanmaru. I don't want to make you do such a thing. Uh, it's okay, Sara. I... I don't want to hurt you, Nanmaru. My precious friend. I'll be okay. Thank you. I'll handle it skillfully. Alice, and so, and Keiji. Sada was telling Nanmaru not to do it, just like the other route, right? Denotatively, yes, but the connotation, the implicit side of her words, is very different. Every part of this is a clever bit of manipulation. Let's break it down. First, she argues, it won't go well. This is not the immediate and genuine moral rejection she expresses in the aptly named emotion route. Instead, it's an argument from practicality. This prompts Nanmaru's response, it'll be fine. Having heard what she said, Nanmaru wants to prove her wrong with her actions. The idea hasn't changed at all. In fact, he might feel even more motivated by this. Her next argument is completely unrelated to the previous one, which could be taken as her subtly ceding the point to Nanmaru. There is an implicit, okay, but... Next, she says, I could never kill an ally. But that wasn't the plan Nanmaru proposed from the beginning. He said he could kill anyone. Again, Sada isn't actually challenging him at all. In fact, the implication of her words is that she doesn't think it's a bad idea, but she doesn't want to get the blood on her hands. Amaru is even more energized. Her final argument, I don't want to make you do that. I don't want to hurt you, my precious friend. This is brilliant on so many levels if the goal was to make Nanmaru do it. Sure, reverse psychology is a thing, but it's so much more than that. Firstly, it's a reminder that Sada doesn't have a moral objection. She's implying it's a bothersome or taxing task, not a moral evil. Secondly, she's doubling down on the aspect that it's taxing. Nanmaru has already decided that he has no problem doing it himself of taking on the burden. Even more now, it's something he has to do so Sada doesn't have to. Finally, and most damningly, it plays into Danmaru's misguided sense of self and personal value that we broke down. It shows that Sada already understood him more than we did, and proves exactly why she was such a menace in the AI test runs. Danmaru completely believes he's helping the only person he cares about. The more controlling aspect behind his behavior is actually his own fear of death, but he has now completely recontextualized Contextualized it under the view that his actions contain an aspect of selflessness. Again, he doesn't really care about Sada as her own person, even if he believes he does. Side note, there is a concept in psychology called the Benjamin Franklin effect, a cognitive bias where when person A does a favor for person B, it's actually likely to make person A grow more fond of person B. So in this case, Sada is actually feeding his obsession with her even more. It's up to interpret interpretation on whether you want to believe this applies to the story written by one guy's hands, but I thought it was interesting to note and potentially adds yet another layer of depth. 
So from this point on, we have two different Namarus who have developed thanks to this event in drastically different ways, yet stemming from the same roots and similarly rooted in his emptiness. I'm going to begin with the logic route. You'll see why later. Of course, where Sada's manipulation leads is the enactment of his plan. First, he contrives a scenario to single out and confront Keiji, writing down a theory that Keiji is a human from Asunado, the piece of information Nanmaru was bestowed with that raised suspicion of a traitor. Mid-confrontation, Sada appears, causing Nanmaru to panic and release smoke with his upgrade part. He subdues both Keiji and Sada with his taser upgrade part, then proclaims Keiji will be left for last. He locks up Keiji before anyone else can catch up to Sada. He pilfers the ID card from Sada and uses the little time he has left to make his way to the computer room and take advantage of the confusion to get off a kill. At some point before or after, he ran into Kyutaro, who wanted to gather everyone to talk about the banquet, and potentially use this to buy a little more time and secure an alibi. Yabusame happened to be in the room with the magnetizable ceiling, making for the easiest target since Lanmaru already knew how it worked and wouldn't have to waste any time. If Alice is the one still alive in your route, this is a direct parallel to how he accidentally killed the real Hinako in a sort of cosmic karma. Smugly thinking he can get away with it, Nanmaru thought wrong because Kurumara appears and attacks him. There's no time to waste, so he tells everyone to rush to the locker room on the lower floor. Nanmaru thought Kurumara was dead, so he didn't turn off the transceiver he had and muttered something about winning. There's no way around this. It's a little bit contrived. Sure, it makes sense, but it definitely feels a little rushed in terms of them finding out the culprit immediately. Nanmaru acts very carelessly here, which kind of conflicts with how well thought out the plan was up until this point. It's not implausible since he likely believed he had already won, but still, he was far from out of the weeds because he would need to kill the rest of them all while not being found out. But anyway, Sada asks Nanmaru if it was him who really did this. Nanmaru pauses, likely considering if there is a way out of the confession, then responds. What happens next is arguably the most controversial writing decision in the entire game, and the primary reason for why I wanted to make this video. We're gonna win, aren't we? Nanmaru transforms into a more sinister, more edgy version of himself. To many, this is Yanmaru, a portmanteau of his name and the infamous anime trope he seems to overlap with, the Yandere. According to dictionary.com? Wait, really? It's in there? A Yandere is often sweet, caring, and innocent before switching into someone who displays an extreme, often violent or psychotic, level of devotion to a love interest. I'll admit, the name is kind of funny and cute, but is it apt? Well, kinda, maybe, not really, because Nanmaru, regardless of what he tells himself, isn't devoted to Sada. He's devoted to himself. Hinako points this out, and she's right. During the ensuing fight, he actively goes against her own pleas and tells her to shut up. The term Yandere is problematic in general, as in many cases it's an oversimplification of the characters it describes, and at worst it's completely misapplied. I don't mind the nickname, but it is important to understand that it's descriptive rather than prescriptive of how he's actually written. Speaking of the writing, it's a common criticism that this comes out of nowhere, that Nanmaru is acting out of character here or being reduced to something he isn't. If you've been following the video so far, you can probably guess that I think this is completely wrong. In fact, it almost could not have been more foreshadowed without him just looking at the camera and reading out the script ahead of time from a teleprompter. It can in no way be called a mischaracterization either, as its character has been firmly established and has been leading directly to this point. It's actually the other route that hijacks his arc halfway through and bends it another direction. A lot of fans want to paint Nanmaru as this uwu nice sheep boy, when it literally couldn't be further from the truth. This is the guy who hates seeing people happy. He's a ball of insecurity, fear, and misplaced self-worth. 
He was a ticking time bomb, and Sada added fire to the fuse. Wait, those metaphors don't mix. None of this is to say I can't understand where they are coming from, particularly if they came off the emotion route into this one. I feel like some might be projecting their feelings of betrayal and anger towards Danmaru's character right past him into Nankidai. If you completely remove it from all context, Yanmaru can come off as cartoonishly evil. It's definitely played up with his change in appearance and complete complete shift in demeanor, but Nanmaru really doesn't care if he's seen as evil at this point or if he even is evil. He's already living through a nightmare, and after getting attached to Sada decided he wanted to live, so he just has to win this damn game no matter what or who he has to become, because he himself is empty. There's not much else to say in regards to his character after this point that wouldn't just be summarizing. <laughs> Other than that he just stays like this for the rest of the game, maliciously compliant, which I don't know, I just find kind of funny. And I'm obviously assuming you've played the game, so I'll stop here and let's go take a peek at the other side. Many of the actions Nanmaru takes are the same regardless of route, but they are recontextualized. In the emotion route, instead of a plan to kill the non-Sada participants, Nanmaru simply wanted to lure Keiji because he genuinely believed he's the traitor. Because of that, and because he believes he killed Kudamata, that's why he locks him up. No ulterior motive. He still tases Sada when she approaches him and pilfers the ID from her. Except this time, instead of using it to activate a trap, he boots up the Joe AI and attempts to insert it into himself, but is stopped by Midori before his plan can come into fruition. His plotline more or less ends there until he dies unceremoniously. Now for why I decided to talk about this one second. It's because the writing here doesn't feel as cohesive in my opinion. In fact, the treatment Nanmaru receives in the emotion route is a large part of why I prefer the logic route. Let me justify those statements. In the logic route, every event builds and builds and it culminates in the reveal of Yanmaru and the death of Yabusame. Every action Nanmaru takes is in service of the same ultimate plan. The mystery established when Sada becomes shrouded in smoke and approaches Keiji, gives us the pieces and builds to a single, satisfying conclusion, with immense payoff and unshakable consequences. Not only did it result in a character death, but it also served as the conclusion to the quote-unquote true Sada arc. As witnessing the consequences of her actions firsthand and receiving an empathetic talk from Kyutaro resulted in her ultimately resolving herself not to become the person Midori wanted wants her to be. However, the emotion route doesn't have this. Let's delve into it. His plan was just to lock up Keiji. What was he actually hoping to accomplish in doing this alone? He didn't want anyone else to know about what he was doing. Why? Probably because he wouldn't be believed, so he locks him up. Then what? Either Keiji escapes later and nothing gets accomplished, which is what happened, or he stays there unable to attend the main game and dies. Congrats, Nanmaru, you just killed a man without letting anyone else have a say. But if that was his intention, Attention, why not just do it directly? He clearly has it in him. It was his plan to begin with, before being told off by Sada. Did he learn his lesson from his talk with her, or didn't he? Then Sada shows up, completely unrelated to his plan to lock up Keiji other than not wanting her to have a say. He knocks Sada out and takes the ID so he can go to the AI Seaver and put Joe in him. Wait, that sounds fucked up. But that plot point goes nowhere because he fails. It evaporates literally as soon as it is introduced with no lasting consequence. He remains a passive character and then dies. So from a plot perspective, what did all of this accomplish? It's a contrived excuse for Keiji to be put away until he can return so the finale of the banquet can happen. That's it. And listen, don't get me wrong. When playing through for the first time, the appearance of the Joe AI does feel significant. If Nanmaru actually succeeded, it could have been really big and have massive implications. But as it stands, it's just a shallow callback. If you have a different opinion and you think there was a lasting impact on the plot itself, let me know in the comments, because I would like to be convinced to enjoy it more than I do. Don't know if you've noticed, but I've been choosing my words carefully. I do think this storyline is weak when it comes to the plot. However, I don't find it weak when it comes to character. 
Getting past the questions of what Nanmariu was intending to do when it came to Keiji, his actions actually show another facet of his character quite excellently, though not how you might initially suspect. When Sara rejected Nanmaru's immoral suggestion and cried, Nanmaru realized something. Maybe he really wasn't human. Nobody who was truly human would plan something like he did. At the very least, he didn't have value as one. The worst outcome was subverted, but the issue of Nanmaru's own self-worth remained unaddressed and in fact only festered and manifested in a different way. Throwing away his identity to become Joe wasn't a heroic act. Instead of embracing his emptiness and becoming a shell who thinks only of winning, this Nanmaru chose to fill it with someone else. What he was doing was not normal. It was creepy in its own way, and more than anything, very sad. His dedication to Sada was all he had left. After the second Mabel fight concludes, Nanmaru asks Sada, Was I useful? This is further confirmation that he doesn't see himself as human anymore, and isn't trying to. He's describing himself like he's a tool, and when he dies, he isn't thinking of himself at all. That sounds like a good thing, and indeed selflessness is an admirable attribute, but it's not. The basic drive for survival is human, and he doesn't even have that anymore. I can't think of a more tragic end for his character. There's a certain undertone to the emotion root that I've never seen anyone acknowledge. Charitably, it can be described as bittersweet, but whatever it is, it's deceptively dark. Something similar to what I just described with Nanmaru happened earlier with the death of So. His entire character arc has been about his intense desire to live, all the way up until the very end of the second main game, where just after begging to be saved, he learns that Kana is on the chopping block and completely shifts gears and demands Sada kills him. And she does. Her reason? She hated him. Just because So was acting selflessly, can this really, in all honesty, be called a good ending? Sada killing him, just like in the AI runs that terrified him? Throwing away the greater chance for everyone left to escape together because of her own hatred? Furthermore, Kana was prepared to die from the beginning, not because she lacked value. Even when during the main game she began to really believe in her own value, her resolve remained unchanged. So wanted to live. It's presented as the good ending to the chapter, and comparatively it is. But that just makes the underlying darkness even more disturbing. In the logic route, Hanmaru becomes the worst possible version of himself, kills someone, then arguably gets his just desserts in the end when he is denied the outcome he sought with his violence. Yabusame's death is no doubt tragic and unfair, but if you think about it this way, the karma comes full circle, especially if it's Alice who dies for the aforementioned reasons. Hanmaru's story of the emotion route is just pathetic and sad. It's dressed up nicely, but underneath it's nothing but the tragedy of a broken guy. None of this is a criticism of the emotion route, by the way. I personally believe it's intentional, as well as indicative of where it could potentially end. We'll have to see when the final chapter arrives. Either way, it is no doubt very intriguing and makes me appreciate the layers to Nakidai's writing even more. And there you have it, the tragedy of Ranmaru Kageyama. It begins as the ordinary struggle of a young man finding his place. Contrary to what I may have implied, I believe Nanmaru is a good person, or at least a normal person. High school is a time where kids are meant to make mistakes, to learn and grow, to find their own worth and to learn to understand others. Nanmaru was simply deprived of that chance and was thrown into the worst environment where the best and worst sides of humans are amplified while he was in a temporary rut. He was denied the normal pathway to maturity by the extenuating circumstances of a life or death game. No matter how you slice it, no matter which route you take, this story ends with a boy never making it out alive to grow into a well-rounded adult. There is no escape. It may not be the case to himself, but to me, Nanmaru is a human. His flaws and inner turmoil highlight this more than he could understand. After all, I can't think of anything more human than being so deeply affected by the basic intimacy of holding another person's hand. 
Seriously, thank you to everyone who made it this far. Nankidai's writing <laughs> really is something else, isn't it? So, to answer myself from the start of this video, I think Nanmaru's character is so much more nuanced than everyone gives him credit for. I have some issues plot-wise with how he is handled in both routes, particularly the emotion route, but I think his character writing is strong nonetheless. I think Yanmaru is 100% in character and justified by the narrative, which was the original reason I wanted to write this, motivated by the vast amounts of slander I've seen going around. But as I wrote it, I began to realize that Nanmaru is a way deeper character than I even imagined. It just goes to show how rich and layered the writing of this game really is. Is. If you have a different opinion about any of this, feel free to voice it in the comments. I seriously love seeing your guys' thoughts on things even if I disagree. I think that when there's mutual respect, it leads to us coming to understand things about the games we previously didn't, and to see the various perspectives one can come into it with. A lot of the writing in the game is implicit rather than spelling everything out to the player, so there's room for interpretation that can give any individual player their own version of the world, and I think that's fitting considering it's a game about different perspectives. Leave a like if you liked it to please the algorithm gods, subscribe if you want more content like this, follow my Twitter if you feel like it, and also my editor xlock as without them this video would take way longer to come out and still be overall worse. With all that said, I go for tasty nachos and you go by.